Okay, hello everyone. I am here today with Dr. Jamar Tisby. Jamar is a friend of mine, um, and he is a wonderful, wonderful person. I'm trying to think of other good adjectives to describe you, Jamar, because you're one of my favorite people. Handsome, yeah. likable, <laughs> whatever you want. Likeable. You can just anything. <laughs> yeah. Anything you would say about like Brad Pitt yes. or Denzel Washington, Denzel Washington yeah. or, you know, whomever. <laughs> Fill in with any handsome, dashing movie star and we'll just put those adjectives on you too, okay? <laughs> Welcome to Pulse 21, the podcast that, in 21 minutes or less, provides inspiration and insights from influential leaders who are guiding the restoration industry into the future. Stop working harder and start working smarter. I'm going to let you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started. So uh, yeah, whenever you're ready, just take it away. Like you said, Dr. Jamar Tisby, and I have always been in the classroom (laughs) in some some way, shape, or form. Um, uh, uh, An undergrad degree from Notre Dame wasn't enough. I took a break from uh, being a student to become a teacher. So I moved from the Midwest near Chicago down to the Delta in Arkansas uh, as part of the Teach for America program and was a sixth grade science and social studies teacher, then became the middle school principal grades five through eight, then went back to school this time as a student again to get a master's in divinity in Jackson, Mississippi, then uh, still wasn't done, uh, decided to get a PhD in history at the University of Mississippi, where I focused on race, religion, and social movements in the 20th century. Perfect. And that is where we met, because um, for those people who do not know, Next Gear Solutions, um, while we are acquired by CoreLogic now, but Next Gear was based in Oxford, Mississippi. And you and I had some mutual friends, and we sat down and had lunch one day on the campus of Ole Miss, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. Yes, here we are. Yeah. Here we are. So um, today we want to talk about, because this is one of your specialties and this is a way that you can help us, um, for companies that are looking to diversify their workforce, um, for being a, um, a force for good and a force for bringing more equity and inclusion into the world. Um, I explained a little bit earlier um, offline about uh, our, what our clients do. Um, so we have, you know, we have people all over the, the country and, and even the world who use our software. And maybe some of them are saying, you know what, I'm looking around and everybody looks the same, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And um, how do we how um, what are some steps we can do to change that? What can we do to uh, um, diversify? So we were going to start off by talking about um, we from there. Tell us a little bit about the difference in diversity equity and inclusion. And um, what are some ways that companies can assess, you know, who they are and where they are, especially in this hiring crisis, right? Right. Where everybody's looking for a workforce. So this is a perfect time to implement some of these practices. So anyway, I'm talking too much. Let's, let's, let's throw it over to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, 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 important topic. So first of all, let's, let's build a little framework here. Um, I'm assuming that if people are tuning into this message, they're, they're somewhat interested in diversity, equity, inclusion, however we want to label it. But I also know that especially in a business setting that sometimes these conversations can feel forced. Sometimes they can feel like an obligation. Sometimes people are just doing it because the boss told them to or it's required by company policy. I hear that. And there's a lot of not so great training out there that makes those feelings perfectly valid. We'll talk about that. What makes for some good uh, training. But I also want to say this. um, This diversity, equity and inclusion, these conversations that we're having about race and ethnicity, it makes good business sense. So if you want to run a good business, this is the, these are the topics you have to think about. So th- think about already um, the 18 and younger crowd is already majority minority. We keep talking about 2040, 2050 window when the, the nation will be majority minority. There will be no single ethnic group that is the majority. Well, that's already happening with the youngest 
people in our country. And these are the folks who already you're going to start to want to look at for future employment. So you already have to be aware of it because of the changing workforce. But on top of that, as you're thinking about hiring um, many, many companies are are just starved for more workers right now. What are workers looking for? And what gives companies an, a competitive advantage for the best talent? A lot of workers are looking for diversity. A lot of workers are looking for a company that has some sort of commitment to racial justice, equity, inclusion, those kinds of things. So again, this simply makes good business sense. Now, that being said, there's a lot of voices out there saying a lot of different things. And so it can be hard to cut through all of that information to get to what's really helpful and what's really effective. I spent a lot of time studying this. I spent a lot of time living this. So I'm trying, going to try to be as helpful as possible. And hopefully, uh, after you listen, you'll feel the same way. So all of that <laughs> preamble to your first mm -hmm. question, you know, what's the difference between diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, first of all, the reason why we need DEI is because there has been a misguided emphasis purely on diversity, which can be merely aesthetic. It can be merely visual. It can be merely getting people with different skin colors in the same room with no actual changes to the organization or the way it operates. So this is where equity and inclusion comes in. Um, one person explained it, by the way, y'all, I wrote this book, How to Fight Racism. And even though I wrote it, I haven't memorized it. I don't yeah, like it's just, so I can't believe it. <laughs> don't mind me if I if I have to read directly from it. But I also want to get the quote right. There's a guy named Robert Sellers, who's the chief diversity officer at the University of Michigan. And he put it this way to explain the difference between diversity, equity and inclusion. He says diversity is where everyone is invited to the party. Equity means that everyone gets to contribute to the playlist. Inclusion means that everyone has the opportunity to dance. Diversity, you're invited to the party. Equity, you get to choose the playlist, what music is on. And inclusion, you actually get invited to dance. Now, isn't that powerful as we think about our companies and organizations? So certain companies may have a level of diversity. They're inviting people into the company. And so maybe there are scholarships or internships that, that get people's feet in the door. But is there equity in the sense that they have a say in how the organization operates. Just like at the dance, we have a say in what music is played. Because if I go and there's 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 all of this Beatles music playing, no offense to the Beatles, but that's just not my genre. <laughs> right, uh, yeah. We're going to have to get we're going to have to get some 90s R&B in there, which is by far <laughs> the best decade of R&B music. Um, do we get a say? That's equity. Is there a sharing of power? And then inclusion. Is there a sense of actually being wanted and welcome there? Because just like DEI training in general, there could be this sort of begrudging, oh, I have to do this. There can be this kind of begrudging attitude of, oh, we have to have these other people here. Otherwise, we're going to look behind in, in, in society. But inclusion says, no, your, your presence is welcome here. It's even celebrated here. So there's a lot more to it than just getting people of different hues and colors in the room. Yeah, you man, you said so many things that I want to ask you more questions on. But one of the things that's very interesting to me is, again, with this hiring crisis coming up, or not coming up, this hiring crisis that is here, um, you know, there's going to be so many younger people entering the workforce. And a lot of times, especially in these, you know, um, restoration contractors can bring people on and train them in the particular skills that they need for that job. And these people can have good jobs that pay good wages. Um, and though, but those are mostly younger people who are going to be coming in. That's right. That's right. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about what these younger people are looking for in a company? Absolutely. So uh, I, I still consider myself young at heart. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm an elder millennial as they would say, but I'm very much sort of, um, in this emerging workforce landscape, 
So we were talking before we press record just about what I've been up to lately. I started my own nonprofit, led that for 10 years, took a brief um, five months working at uh, a university and basically decided that was a that was a clarifying experience for me because I figured out much more clearly what I wanted and what I didn't want in terms of working. So I am totally fine working 100% remotely. Um, I am very much uh, requiring a degree of trust such that I can work sort of within my own parameters in terms of when I start or finish or, or pacing, as long as I deliver what is required, right? Like I don't need a boss over you know, my back, you know, checking on every little thing. So no micromanaging. Um, also want to be part of an organization that's not just giving me a paycheck, but gives a sense of meaning um, and coheres with my values. So if one of my values is like racial justice or, or diversity, equity, and inclusion, then I want a to work for a company that represents those values too. And I'll actually go someplace else even if the pay is equal or perhaps even slightly lower, if there's more resonance in terms of values and principles there. So I can just say that that younger workers are looking for much more than a paycheck. They're looking a lot more for flexibility and um, autonomy, but also to be part of an organization that represents something positive, something, some, some integrity and some, some uh, ethics that they can get behind. And all of that sort of feeds into these ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion at different companies. Let, let's talk a little bit about intentionality mm. um, because, you know, we're not disconnected from our past, correct? And um, the past is always with us in a way. And in, in America, in the past, we always have this awful, you know, this, this past that excluded, you know, particularly African-Americans from the workforce in, mm -hmm. in great ways. So because, you know, you write in your book talking about because there was an exclusion, there needs to be an intentional yeah. inclusion. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. So I'm reminded of an MLK quote. Um, this is from his book, Why We Can't Wait. And he says, it's impossible to create a formula for the future, which, is, which does not take into account that our society has been doing something special against the Negro for hundreds of years. How then can he be absorbed into the mainstream of American life if we do not do something special for him now in order to balance the equation and equip him to compete on a just and equal basis? So... This is critical. This is crucial understanding. A lot of people around the civil rights movement were freshly awakened to the injustice of racism. And they saw these pictures of dogs attacking kids and fire hoses and people getting beaten with batons on the Edmund Pettus Bridge during the march towards Selma. All of this stuff. And they said, oh, this is horrible. We need to get better. And the reaction of many people was... Well, if we made such a big deal about race, then the solution is not to see or, or talk about race. In other words, we should be colorblind. Well, I understand the motivation there. And, and they'll take that colorblind ethos and, and reference one little <laughs> sentence from MLK's I Have a Dream speech where he wants kids to be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin and use that as justification for being colorblind. But we just heard a quote from MLK. If something special has been done against this people group, then something special must be done for this people group. So if there's already a deficit, if there's already inequality, you don't make it to equality by ignoring the inequality, by ignoring the historical ways that people have been treated differently. That's where things like this, this trigger word for a lot of people, affirmative action comes in. Well, if you think about just the actual words, affirmative action, it just means positive initiative. That just means intentionality. 
It doesn't mean getting people who are unqualified. It doesn't mean unjustly excluding people. It means that folks have been unjustly excluded. And in order for them to catch up in a sense, there has to be special attention paid. There has to be special training, special offering, special avenues. For So I'll give you an example. Um, this, is, this is an example where there was not any affirmative action in place. Um, University of Notre Dame, where I graduated, uh, it was in existence for nearly a century before its first black graduate. Um, when I was looking at colleges and universities senior year of high school, Notre Dame wasn't on my radar, not because of anything with the school. It's because I didn't know that it was really an option. Why? They never recruited at my majority uh, black and Latinx school. They went to uh, predominantly white high schools and recruited there. Nothing intentionally racist about that, but here's your recruitment pool. Most of the kids are white. Whereas if they'd gone to my school, most of the kids would have been from a different racial and ethnic background. And to say, oh, hey, our history says we've only gone to these sources for workers, for students, for whomever. We can change that and broaden that because that has excluded a certain people group. What's wrong with that? As a matter of fact, there's everything appropriate about that, especially for a company that wants to intentionally diversify because I'm glad you brought that up because this will not happen by accident. <laughs> like the, there are right. other companies doing things proactively, intentionally, and aggressively to say, hey, this is a place that welcomes all kinds of people. If your company isn't one of those, it's it's going to lose a competitive advantage. Oh, that's so good. Um, so we've talked about, I think we've talked about the what and we've talked about the why. Um, I want to get to that key word in your, in your book, how to fight racism. So how, what are the practical steps that um, companies can take to uh, diversify? Well, there's a lot to say about the how, and in fact, it deserves its own episode. So I think we'll have to wait till part two to get into that. All right, part two it is. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse 21. Join us next episode for part two.